Good evening, friends. Welcome to Life with God. In the second episode of season two, we're taking a historical approach to the subject of goddess presence. And our special guest this evening is Dr. Darius Yankovic. Dr. Darius Yankovic is field and ministerial secretary for the South Pacific Division at the moment. He was uh, also a professor of historical theology in the seminary for a number of years before uh, going back to Australia for this position. And so I'm super excited to welcome him as part of the Life with God project, and especially in this conversation about God as presence in the history of theology. Darius, thank you so much for taking of your time to, to discuss this subject with us. Uh, I appreciate your presence, and I really look forward to your insights on the topic tonight. You're welcome. I'm also excited to welcome Kian, Daniel, and Aaron as part of the discussion. Welcome. And uh, of course, before we open the conversation, we'd like to know a few things about our guest. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Poland, in Europe, Central Europe. What do you like to do in your spare time? I like to play squash, which is similar to racquetball, and windsurf. Where did you go to college and what is your degree? Uh, I went to Avondale College and I received a Bachelor of Arts, but then I went to Andrews University when I got my Master's and PhD. Uh, what is your favorite food? Tomatoes. I could eat them a lot. <laughs> I love tomatoes. Tomatoes or tomatoes, whatever. If you had a day to spend alone in nature, where would you go? Oh, probably on the ocean and sit on the beach and listen to waves, which I live half an hour from the ocean, which is great. <laughs> what do you like to do outside of your work? Uh, like I said, I like to play squash. I like to windsurf and I like to restore things build new things and so on. If you could take a vacation anywhere in the world, where would you go? Maybe outside of the beach? Uh, probably Nepal. I'd like to see the Mount Everest. That would be great. Uh, how do you cope with stress? Uh, go for a walk and perhaps play some squash. That's really great stress reliever. <laughs> What are two or three things um, that your parents have taught you growing up that you appreciate? Uh, to be kind to people around me and to be frugal with my money. So, yeah, basically. Who is your favorite Bible character? Well, apart from Jesus, probably Joseph from Genesis for his wisdom <laughs> and patience. What is your favorite color and is there any reason? Uh, it's probably yellow because I'm uh, an extrovert and kind of generally happy person. So I like to be surrounded by yellow. <laughs> uh, which weather do you prefer, hot or cold? Absolutely hot. That's part of the reason why we left Michigan. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you have a favorite time of the week and why? Oh, Friday night, probably, when I can just rest, put my feet up and read some nice stuff. So Friday night is probably the best. Mm -hmm. Do you have a pet? If not, what would you like to have it? Uh, we have a cat and, and we have a lovely cat. And yes, we've always had cats, mostly. One dog at the beginning of our marriage, but basically cats since then. <laughs> <laughs> what were you most known for in school or at work? Uh, reading books. I've read thousands of books at school uh, when I was young. At work, probably for uh, more, most recently in Andrews University for teaching, I guess, teaching methods. Um, if you could have one supernatural power, what would it be and why? Uh, I would like to stop suffering in the world if I could. That's if I had a possibility that that would be probably what I would do. What are two titles that you think everyone should try to read? Two titles? Other than the Bible. Yeah, two books. <coughs> oh, I think I would say number one book, probably religious literature. It would be Steps to Christ. This is unquestionably one of the best books on theology and Christian living that has ever been written. I really love that little book. Mm -hmm. um, and these are of ages as far outside of the Bible, but this is within the religious sphere, I suppose. 
um, if you have an extra 1,000 bucks to spare, where would you like to spend it? Well, I can answer this in a selfish and unselfish way. <laughs> if it was selfish, then I would go and buy some more tools because I love tools um, to, to do with things. But if I was unselfish, probably to feed some people somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> What's the most adventurous thing you've ever done? Oh, probably rock climbing. So just going up the rocks and then just doing some climbing in the strange places. That was fun. What is your best childhood memory? Oh, probably when my dad was fixing my toys, I suppose. When, yeah, that would be it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Darius. Um, I'm very intrigued by this conversation. I'm very intrigued by the topic we're studying in this season, which is God as presence. Uh, I feel like we have so much to learn about the concept of presence, how to be present uh, to each other, how to be present to ourselves. Uh, and we can best learn that by looking at God, how God is present with us. Um, and as we will discover throughout different episodes, looking into the history of theology, looking into anthropology, looking into the Bible, especially, of course, uh, and then different contexts, leadership, community, and family, um, we will discover different aspects, different features, different ways in which God is present with us. And so I'm really intrigued um, by the kind of knowledge we will receive in this season. Um, particularly tonight, our focus is going to be more historical. Uh, that is part of Darius's expertise. And um, so I would open uh, our discussion tonight with this uh, question. How is God present in history? All right, that's a very good question. And this is probably main reason why I chose the area of my expertise, which is historical theology. I have uh, decided while I was at the seminary that I want to study actually God's presence in, in history of theology. Uh, you know, sometimes as Adventists, we, we have a tendency to dismiss the whole historical period between the apostles and between us, and we just kind of believe that God reconstructed the apostolic age in the 19, 1800s. And uh, with the entrance of Adventism and the gap between the apostolic age and us means really nothing. But uh, I've discovered that it means quite a lot, that uh, Jesus promised uh, before he left that he will be with his uh, people, with church uh until the end and i think that promise was fulfilled and god acted throughout various major de historical development in history even though those people uh, whether the church christian church actually departed from biblical teachings by the middle of second century and ever since then god was was trying and he still has been trying to to bring the church back you know through various movements for various people um, through various historical situations, bring them back to, to himself. And we've got many, many reformation movements um, to bring the church back to the Bible, culminating, of course, in the great 16th century reformation. And, and God was with that movement. We know that. And God worked with those people, people like Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and others, and, and the precursors of the reformation, uh, John Huss, and Wycliffe and other people and before them. So God works with us today. So I think God works with all the people around the world, uh, not just within the Christian stream, but just in general. So I believe that the promise of Jesus was fulfilled when he said he will be with us to the end of the age. And, and he's still with us with as a humanity, not just as a church. Thank you. I'm curious if there is any biogra biographical aspect to your interest uh, to the study. I mean, you mentioned a little bit, but I wonder if, if there is anything more that you could share about what, why did you feel like this is, um, was it, do you feel like it was important for the church or for you personally in, in some, in some way? Based uh, your... It was probably important for me personally. Um, I've always been interested in spiritual things since, since child, <clears throat> since being a child, but I didn't know the exact nature of those interests until I actually came to the seminary. Uh, but I do remember one episode when 
uh, I was participating, I'm not, I was listening to a major evangelistic series in Poland when I was still a child and we had this evangelist come from America and he was talking about church fathers and this was the most exciting thing for me to hear uh, about church fathers. I don't even know why I'm, I became interested in that, but in reality, uh, when I studied at Avondale, I did not see that yet. Uh, I was learning to speak English those days in the late 80s. Uh, but then I became a pastor and uh, after three years I decided that I need to really get better education and I came to Andrews and I started working on my Masters of Divinity in 1993 and it is then that I discovered something absolutely amazing. I took a few courses in history of theology and I just fell in love with uh, what history of theology had to offer and uh, as a result, uh, after one year of studies, a uh, proposal was made to me that I should enter PhD studies, which was not what I planned at first. And I decided that history of theology will be my area because I wanted to see how God's presence exhibited, uh, God, uh, how God, his presence exhibited itself throughout history of Christianity and my mind and my cognitive became Adventist studies. So I wanted to look at the big picture and then at a at, uh, at how all of it led to who we are as Adventists today. So that was basically maybe biographical, I suppose. This is probably coming out of my interest. To this day, I love to read all, I mean, that's my expertise. I, even last night, before I fell asleep, I read a book on history, history of theology. I just enjoy that stuff. So from what I have understand, God, you are saying that God did not just present in the church history, but like the whole human history, right? Like the big. Picture. I think so. Um, is there I a wanna, yeah. Yeah. There uh, a I just wanted to res respond to your first thing. There's a, there's a concept um, that we historical theologians know about called prevenient grace. And prevenient grace is God's grace given to humanity. Ellen White writes it beautifully in uh, Steps to Christ of God and circled the entire globe with atmosphere of his grace. You know, the, how you can imagine that the, just like as, as, as visible almost as the ashes, not A, it's not visible, but as pulp, palpable, how do you say this word, that you can almost taste it. So God's grace is all around the world. I mean, everywhere you look, I think you could see the evidences of God's grace. I've read a book uh, some years ago, um, Finding God in Unexpected Places by Philip Yancey. Uh, you know, before I read that book, I kind of tended to look for God's grace, God's presence only within, uh, within my Christian community. But when I read that book, I kind of decided, okay, I better uh, look um, outside and now I trained myself to look for signs of God's grace anywhere. Australia is a very secular country. Uh, majority of people don't go to church so I, I don't have statistics but I'd say uh, significant majority of people are non-Christian uh, in Australia and yet you can see signs of God's grace everywhere. Uh, every time I see a, a boy holding girl's hand you know that's sign of grace for me and they don't have to be necessarily believers of in god uh, but just how loving one another just showing love to one another when i see a, see a parent uh, showing love to the child you know they may be uh, completely unchristian and yet this is a sign of god's grace each time i attend funeral uh, it may be a non-christian funeral why do we do funerals? Why do we cry at funerals? You know, why do non-Christian people, atheists, cry at funerals? It's it's a sign of God's grace that we're supposed to mean live forever. Each time I see a wedding, even though it's not a Christian wedding, you know, uh, the, for me it's a big sign of grace. This is a commitment a young man makes to a young woman. They don't believe in God, but yet this is a sign of God's grace. So I've trained myself to see God's presence everywhere. Uh, and I believe he got acted in history. He was in history with, with and he's just everywhere through, through his prevenient grace. So, yes. So, the, sorry, I interrupted your second question. Oh, no, I, I just asked for like example, but you already gave a lot of examples. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And I'd like to comment uh, maybe a little bit and you can jump from it. Um, 
what I like the, about that view of God's presence is that it um, it greatly expands our our view of where God can be. In our um, a lot of times Western worldview, we get a lot of European descent Christianity, a lot of you know English and German and Italian and and mm-hmm. you know uh, Israel. Uh, coming right out of there, but then the, the church really expanded into Europe. And that's a lot of the view of God's presence is Roman, or God's presence is English, God's presence is this, but there's, but with, with that idea, if you, if you just look at the interactions and love between humans, that actually expands it into Africa, into Latin America, into Asia, and oh, all these other places where even though our theology may be biblically, uh, there's a lot of European history there, it, it's applicable across the world. It is absolutely. I mean, just think about the missionaries, uh, early missionaries to South America. You know, God's presence was already there. And because of those early missionaries of 17th century, and they were mostly Catholic, uh, Jesuits, no less, they went to South America and they evangelized the whole continent. And, and this is a kind of interesting situation because you also have uh, con- conquistadors who just come and destroy and and uh, rape the country and kill people but you've got mission coming also and the whole tribes are becoming christian and today when you see it uh, south america it's entirely christian you know and and i believe that they may not necessarily be adventists but but uh, they are christian uh, they follow god to the best of their understanding uh, that used to be a pagan animistic kind of religion so so god's grace was even there at that place you know uh, before and that's the beautiful concept of prevenient grace god that is the grace that comes before uh, wherever wherever we go as christians wherever we preach the gospel god's grace already is ahead of us and and, and like i said you can see god's grace in just uh, little acts that people do towards one another they kindness and, and so on so yeah this is a wonderful concept and allowed me to see the world through different lenses than before uh, so what are some challenges when you are studying about the history of theology and like some oh. problems, like, <laughs> like the main problems okay that that's that's a big question that's actually a very sad question um when you look into history of theology you see I see God trying to act, trying to uh, work with humanity, and I see the evil of humanity. Uh, This is is tragic. I think history of Christianity, studying history of Christianity, is probably the saddest uh, study of all. Uh, You can study science, you can study math, it's quite objective, you can study all kinds of things, you know, but when you study, and, and you can study history, in a detached way but when you're a christian when you're a follower of god when you love god when you follow jesus christ and you know what god expects from us as his people then studying christian history is a very very sad thing because you see on the one hand god trying to reveal himself with his love on the other hand you see how people treat each other in the name of religion many wars were fought many people were killed uh, many people were persecuted in the name of religion, and uh, people were put burned at stakes, people were drowned, and this was done by both uh, Catholics and Protestants, you know, when people uh, believe that uh, religion is more important than love, then, then persecution comes. And, and for me, I suppose when I look at history of the church, that sometimes I feel like crying, uh, I know that God leads and God works, but our responses to God are far from what, far from the way we should be, really. The inter- so this is probably a greatest challenge for me when I see people hating each other's guts, hating each other's, not just views, but uh, hating each other because of the views they held. And often that persecution resulted from that. That will be the big challenge for me. So there is, and I have a follow-up question to that. Um... If the history of Christianity is riddled with so much blood and so many episodes of um, that are can be heartbreaking to observe, uh, to 
definitely to experience. I cannot even imagine. Then how do we see God's leading in, of the church um, through that or despite of that? I, I think that while history has a lot of difficulties, okay, a lot of issues, a lot of hatred, a, a lot of war, there's also a lot of goodness. And you can see this, this idea of good and evil fighting throughout history of theology, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, we, we could be really, we could, I mean, the world is evil, we are evil, and we could really devolve into, into terrible kind of version of humanity, just killing each other and hating each other and destroying each other. And yet throughout history of Christianity, there are also... Uh, evidences of people caring for one another, loving one another, wanting to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and I, like I already mentioned this, I don't necessarily agree with much of what Catholic Church is teaching. They still present a gracious God and loving and kind God. And this was that message that they took with themselves to, to South America, for example, or to Africa, to other places where they taught maybe not perfectly the idea that we find in the Bible, yet they presented God who is gracious and merciful and kind and loving, you know? So uh, you see this side by side in history of Christianity. And for me, this is the good of God trying to intervene in the evil of humanity uh, and trying to bring good out of all of this. And I still see God doing that today. And on that point, um, I know a lot of people, especially since our audience is more young adults and young people, they look at the history of theology and they say there's a lot of a lot of evil, and and you so, somewhat addressed it there, but even that the the evil that we see in the history of the church in the Crusades and even today. Um, in all denominations, you have issues with abuse and these sorts of evils that even a, a secular person, an atheist looks at and says, I don't even, I don't even need to mm -hmm. tell you uh, to need God to tell you that's wrong. So why, mm -hmm. why can we say that the history of theology doesn't uh, give us reason to just abandon religion? Well, yes, I recognize this. I recognize that we as Christians have not been the best witness for Christ. You know, uh, Gandhi said, I love your Jesus, but I don't love Christians. I don't see Jesus in Christians. You know, he, uh, he said that statement. And many people around the world would see us as Christians. And, and I would say, you're not a good witness for your Christ. I think that we need to strive to... Um, to be good witness. And I think that in the midst of trouble, in the midst of difficulties, we have a, still have a message as Christians. Uh, we have a message of a loving God who came to this world and embraced us just as we are. You know, I, uh, when I interact with non-Christians, I always try to be as kind as I can with those people uh, to counter around those, counter around counteract those those evils that Christianity sometimes um, perpetrates, you know. Uh, yeah, I have no excuse for the evil that happens among Christians, but God called each one of us to counteract that. And we should see this as our mission when we interact with people around us. I mean, I think what's beautiful for me in this story is that uh, um, because here we have a, a dynamic between God and people where uh, the church, any church really, the Christian church, represents God. Um, and, it, and God is present in the church and leads it despite of us, um, despite of the humanity and the evil. That's correct. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there are these two aspects of humanity and divinity. Um, of course, the, the focus uh, in this conversation is on, on God's presence. And it's interesting to me that in episode one, we, we zoomed in on the uh, kind of the personal dimension of presence where God is present with each one of us individually. And now we see that there's another dimension to God's presence, 
where he works at the corporate level, if you want, at the, the broader mm-hmm. level of humanity, maybe different segments. And, um, and, and I wondered too, if this, this would complement our understanding of God's presence, um, especially maybe when in the individual aspect we're struggling. So there is another place where we can go to see that. And maybe where, where we struggle to see God's presence in the history, mm-hmm. we can go to the personal aspect. Like you said, there is one-on-one mm-hmm. relationships um, and seeing God's presence through that relationship, through the personal aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, yeah, it's God, God's presence is multidimensional. Um, so Absolutely. I, I guess I could also uh, dig a little more into maybe your research, Darius. Um, like maybe what are some of the things that you discovered in your research about God's presence in history um, that were surprising to you? All right, that's a, that's an e- easy question. Okay. Uh, my, well, let me speak in general, maybe. Uh, as Adventists, we believe that we come, we came the closest to the scripture uh, as far as the, the teaching, um, as far as the biblical teachings and so on, we came to the closest to what we find in the scripture. Uh, but I've discovered one thing, nothing really, nothing that we teach as Adventists, perhaps with the exception of the uh, acceptance of inspiration of uh, Ellen White, has, is, is unique. Every doctrine that we've, we're teaching as Adventists is, has been taught by somebody already in the past. So throughout history of Christianity, you see those bits and pieces here and there that somebody taught a small element of what we have as, as, what we have as Adventists today. Uh, that's probably the biggest surprise on a big scale uh, for me. Mm-hmm. So nothing that we have is unique. So I kind of, when I teach, when I present to pastors, I... I do this little thing, uh, I show them tree. And the tree is um, like the theological tree with uh, various fruits on it, you know? And those fruits are theological fruits and I can just imagine our pioneers going around the theological tree and picking what they thought were the best fruits from the theological tree. And they put it in a basket, they of course got some, bad fruit with, with some worms that they had to weed out or t- take out later on and refine later on. But that's the biggest surprise, I suppose, that everything that we teach as Adventists has been taught by somebody in the history of Christianity. So, so you know, uh, for me, that's a great sign of God's leading. And, and I love this. And that connects us as Adventists with the rest of Christianity. We're not the isolated group that's discovered something unique in the scripture. The uniqueness of Adventism is not in theological teachings, but in the way we put those theological teachings together. Mm-hmm. That's the uniqueness. You know, the systematic theology is a system of bringing everything together that we've seen in the history. Uh, to bring it into one good theological system that we today call 28 fundamentals. But like I said, everything has been taught before. So, so we come in a stream of Christianity, you know, um, that some things we can accept, some things we need to reject uh, from what we've seen in the past, but that God leading for the Catholic Church, you know, uh, one of the interesting discoveries that I made uh, why would God send the 16th century reformation to the church if he didn't care for the church? He deeply cared for Christian church at, the, at that time, even though it was, we could call it apostate church, the church that went away from the Bible. But God sends reformation to that church, hoping that the church would reform. And the church did not reform to the extent I think God would want it. So the reformation continued, you know. So I suppose that would be the biggest, uh, biggest finding of that, that I've had uh, in my research. So, so far, <laughs> there was just so many because um, you are, tr- um, I'm, from what I've learned so far, because there was just so many, I'm just going to summarize it. So at the beginning, when you explain about the human history, like how there was evil, but there's also grace. Um, mm-hmm. My first impression about God's presence in human history was all about grace. So if you can see grace, that's kind of like an indication of 
God's grace, I mean, God's presence. Mm -hmm. But then now you are talking like understanding is another evidence of God's presence. Is that so? Like when God leads reformation, that's another sign that God is with us in the history. Mm -hmm. God is um, leading the Adventist church together for us to bring the theological uh, understanding together. Mm -hmm. That's another sign of um, God's presence. Is that mm -hmm. so? It's that's correct. Of human interaction. <laughs> of how human is doing to other human, that's the point when we can feel God's presence. Is that so? Correct. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, just building on what you said, we can have the best theology, but if we don't know how to treat each other in a godly way, then the best theology is not going to help you. Hmm. So those two things need to go together, theology and experience, Christian experience. So yes, absolutely. Uh, I have a question. So, uh, in 1800s and starting on from then on, like there are many ideas about evolution and scientific mm -hmm. part of like by Charles mm -hmm. Darwin and Wallace. I mean, so are there like any problems like you face against those ideas, or like what are your main uh, arguments? I've got a basic philosophical problem. Uh, with evolution, absolutely. I know that um, the evolutionary theory uh, and the concepts of ma naturalistic materialism, uh, that's, that's the world without God, everything happened by chance and, and so on, came as a result of the Enlightenment, where during the Enlightenment, actually, the Enlightenment is, uh, the Enlightenment movement, we could say, is one big rejection of religion, uh, the failure of religion to uh, do good in the world, the Enlightenment came and um, kind of said, people, Enlightenment thinkers said, we don't need religion, we don't need a God. And uh, da Darwin worked within that framework. He tried to find naturalistic way of explanation of life, origin of life, and so on. Yes, I have studied uh, this stream of thinking quite a lot. And um, I've got fundamental differences with, with uh, that teaching. Uh, for me, and this is kind of interesting, um, when I, yeah, oh, let me just begin with this. The naturalistic philosophy basically teaches that we are here by chance, that um, our morals are human agreement, that we agree on morality that we nobody gave us that morality type of thing we agree on that and and survival of the fittest is another part that whoever is fittest will survive uh, the, the the organisms that are not fit they need to be destroyed and and damaged um, so basically only strongest people should survive and only uh, people who uh, can have this strength within them the rest needs to disappear and look at look at today's world in an atheistic world like australia like uh, i mean secular parts where i'm from we still have nursing homes uh, we take care of weak children and sick children we provide health care for those we should be damaging all this stuff and destroying the weak you know the weak are just uh, unnecessary part of this whole thing and and yet we've got tons of nursing homes nursing run by government secular government you know here we, at this moment we're experiencing floods in australia last year we experienced big fires and government secular government is helping people why those people should be gone if they can't be strong can't take care of themselves they should be gone and let the, only the strongest live and yet and yet we've got human helping other humans uh, some group of people who are a little bit better off on higher grounds are helping people who are on lower grounds you know when there are accidents people run and help and for me those are rumors of god's grace even within the atheistic world so i I once uh, had a conversation with an atheist and a person who embraced evolutionary view uh, completely. And I challenged him. I asked him, what is good? And he had a difficulty answer. This is another question about the values. Where do values come from? 
So, so he explained to me, okay, good is when, and he used this illustration, when I see an old frail lady on the side of the road and she wants to cross the road and she cannot cross the road because it's a busy road. So I go and I help her and this is good. And I said to him, you're completely out of your mind. According to your evolutionary mindset, if somebody cannot cross the road in a, in a, in a uh, modern world, they are weak. They need to be destroyed. You not taking. You shouldn't be taking that person uh, across the road. You should push that person to be killed because she's a burden on the society. You know, and and he didn't quite know what to say to that <laughs> uh, because uh, because survival of the fittest would clearly teach that. And yet, you see, when you observe people who are embrace evolutionary thinking. They love each other. They love husbands, love their wives. Parents love their children. Uh, parents would die for their children. And I've seen parents who embrace evolutionary points of view, taking care of their uh, children who were affected by some kind of bad illness or, or something like that. I mean, if you an evolutionist, you should just get rid of that person, you know, uh, but we don't. Uh, those people don't. So even when they embrace this materialistic worldview of survival of the fittest, uh, yet we see humanity coming through uh, very powerfully, the, the, the God's grace coming through in their lives. And for me, uh, this is just amazing, actually. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I hope I answered this the way you wanted to, me That's to answer. A yeah, that's a very interesting part of this discussion um, that um, is kind of unexpected, but I, I really appreciate it too, because it also speaks about God's presence in creation. Yes. We're talking about the history of the world. The history of the world began with creation. And so how was God present in creation? That is a, a question that is answered very differently in um, a Christianity, depending on whether you accept uh, mm -hmm. evolution or not. The theistic evolution, I guess, is becoming mm -hmm. more prevalent now. Um, I don't know if you would like to expand a little more on that, Darius, on um, just a concept of God's presence in creation as part of the beginning stage of world history. Well, or... you just, you know, uh, you look at the whole idea of origin of life and scientists have been trying to reproduce the original um, circumstances where life came to be from this primordial soup and so on, and nothing ever worked thus far. Uh, the origin of life is the greatest mystery uh, there is. Um, people are trying to find how, uh, how this group of non-animated uh, or basically dead uh, chemicals came together to form a living cell. Uh, you know, we call it a simple cell, but uh, a cell is far from being simple. When you look at the inner workings of a cell, a simple cell, the simplest of all cells, it's a mind-boggling, boggling, complicated factory that makes proteins and all other things and is able to reproduce itself and so on. How can this possibly happen uh, out of just a few chemicals? Nobody can answer this. Uh, for me, uh, of course, God initiated life. God is the originator of life. He's the one who brought everything together. Uh, he's the grand designer. Uh, you look around the nature and you see design everywhere. Uh, for me, I for me it would be very difficult to accept evolutionary thinking philosophically. I just for it, it for me it requires greater faith to be an evolutionist than actually believe in creator God. And, and when you embrace that, when you em embrace God creatorship, yes, you can see evil in nature. You can see destruction. You can see the, uh, the sin that basically destroyed nature to a large extent. But when you look very carefully, you see God's presence everywhere. And, and uh, you see normally uh, when you leave elements to itself, uh, they just tend to disintegrate. This is, I, I think, I can't remember exactly now, but this is the second law of thermo, th or third law of thermodynamics, where when there's a natural entropy, things just like disintegrate. 
in nature you you see things coming together you know when a plant is uh, growing up it's organized uh, in a very specific way it's not disorganized you leave it alone and it organizes itself and it did and this goes against what we uh, what we would normally accept you know uh, so Yes, I can recognize that people who embrace evolution, they, they've got some valid points of view. Uh, but for me, it, it, accepts a, it is a greater faith. <laughs> you have to have greater faith to accept that things happen by itself than a belief in creator God. So in a sense, we could say maybe that God's presence, um, God is present um, through the imprints that he leaves in creation oh yes absolutely um, all over um, you see somebody somebody once said that um, creation could be compared to a painting and every painting has a signature a great painting has a signature of the author uh, sometimes it's not clearly visible but if we look carefully we'll find that signature and we can find god's hand in nature everywhere mm. maybe just real quick uh since we're touching on this um the aspect of um, evil in theistic evolution. The biggest problem that theologians struggle with today is uh, if they accept evolution is that um, evil was present in creation before the fall, um, right? So the animal suffering That's, is present. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and that um, is correct. Yes. That is something I personally, having studied it, I have not found a, a good explanation, even though there are many attempts. No. Um, and to me, God's presence in creation is a, is a loving and powerful presence at the same time, because if you, in theistic evolution, you either have to discard of the love or of the power uh, in his ability to, to, to have a, a creative presence um, that's worthy of someone to worship, I guess I would say. That is correct. Yes, that is correct. I, uh, I have difficulties uh, combining the two words, theistic and evolution, because evolution, uh, materialistic evolution comes with a philosophy attached to it. And uh, philosophy is known as mat materialistic naturalism uh, that basically excludes the presence of God. The, the whole evolutionary thinking uh, excludes God's presence and, and has this philosophy attached to it. And now you put theistic. Theistic comes from theos, uh, which is in Greek God. And what kind of God is evolution presenting uh, this, this this materialistic philosophy it's a cruel kind of god it's it's a god that is certainly not loving god that is presented in the scriptures to me a god who enters this world of suffering and pain and and brings solution uh, to what we experience as human beings so theistic evolution is kind of an oxymoron for me it's very difficult for me to embrace it because evolutionary thing like we talked about survival of the fetus this is not the way i see god operates in the scriptures you know he he teaches us to care for the weakest uh, from i mean when you read the prophets um of old testament it's all about social justice about caring for the widow caring for the uh, caring for the orphans and caring for the poor uh, that's not what evolutionary thinking proclaims, you know, um, and we see the God caring for poorest of the poor, and he comes to the world as poorest of the poor, you know, uh, in, in the person of Jesus Christ. So that's not evolutionary thinking at all. And for me to, to put evolutionary and theism in the same word is just destruction of God's name that I see in the scriptures. So I, for me, th that's the greatest difficulty with the whole idea concept of theistic evolution. So I have one more question. Um, it's, so just by listening to all of your um, comments um, and response, I kind of feel like the existence of human life is the evidence of God's presence. Absolutely. I mean, just think about it. Uh, can you think about it? I have two children. All right. And I remember uh, when my wife was pregnant. Okay. Those children were formed. I had nothing to do with it, really. When they were formed in my wife's womb, everything was coming together. We're witnessing uh, this 
by using ultrasounds and different things, uh, how, how the baby grew. And it, all, it was all happening almost on its own. Just think how many things could go wrong in that whole process. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of things that could go wrong. And yet, for the most, yes, sometimes things, bad things happen and birth malfunction, I mean, something, I mean, bad things happen, of course. But majority of births are, are just, children come up well and it's this happened on its own you know so so the very presence of life presence of us here on the fact that we exist you know uh one of the greatest philosophical questions in the world is why there is something where there could be nothing you know and there is no answer for this <laughs> from a non-christian point of view uh, from a christian point of view uh, there is an answer god created us god gave us meaning and God takes us on a journey with him, you know? So this is his presence with us. Um, the whole idea of meaning for him, it's not just existence of humans, the meaning of our life, why we are here, where we came from, why we're here, where are we going, you know? We as Christians have answers to those questions uh, because of God's presence in, uh, in, in, in human history. Uh, for an evolutionist, they do not have answers to those questions. Uh, but you know, question, yeah. Um, can there be a point where the human existence does not tell about God's presence? Like that we are destructed, like evil to the worst, that we can't do it anymore? <laughs> I don't think so. I think so long humanity exists, you will see god's grace working with us um you will see people helping each other uh even strangers helping strangers they you know you'll see good things good things happen in the world yes we are damaged by sin very much so uh, we we have the imprint of sin on our lives and there's lots of evil that happens in humanity and it happened in human history, but there's lots of good that happened in human history and that good will not cease. I don't think that the point will arrive that we will be so bad that, that uh, there will be no more witness to God's presence within humanity. I don't think we'll ever arrive at this point. Maybe just taking it to looking forward for our for our church. If God's been present in the past, um, even given less than ideal circumstances, if not purely evil circumstances, um, how should that inform our future? And and <laughs> given our um, our view of how history's direction goes, how should we? internalize God's presence into our current church, especially well, as we are having a lot of uh, a lot of people leave the church. It's not a very popular thing. I know. How is God's presence informing that? Well, I, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, from Ellen White is this one. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings through in our past history. I think this is probably the, the greatest quote in, in my mind. I really love this quote. We often attach it just to Adventist history, but I see it as a, as a the whole human history. When we see how God led us through the valley of sin, you know, um, in Psalm 23, God leads us through the valley of death and sin. That, that, that means that we will have troubles in this world. There will be problems, there will be evil, but God will lead us if we put our trust in him. So God led us in the history. God led us in our past as, as Adventists and as Christians and as God's people, you know, Israel. And God did not just care for Israel. The Bible testifies that he cared for the nations surrounding Israel also as well. So as we look into the past, we can be confident that God will continue leading us. And to just answer your observation that many people leave the church, you know that most 
people who leave the church, they do not, do not leave the church because of doctrinal issues, but because interpersonal issues, because of judgmentalism, because of hypocrisy, because of the way we treat one another. That's the main reason why people leave the church. So if I internalize God's grace, if I live my life with Christ, then he works with me and in me to become the person he wants me to be. And I pray and hope that I will never be the person that will cause another person to leave the church. That's my prayer and my hope. I would ask maybe one last question before we move into the takeaways, because uh, this was an unexpected trajectory of the discussion. I love it. Uh, we've started in the Christian church and then we went towards the origins. And um, Aaron was actually anticipating my question uh, with his own so what about the future? Um, so I wonder, Darius, you can, if you can give us a glimpse of, um, as a historian, maybe, as a, as a Christian historian, uh, from your knowledge of the Bible and in history, what can we expect in the future in terms of, um, in terms of God's presence? Okay, so you see that sin has clouded God's presence in our lives. And that's why Jesus had to come to reveal who God really is. Uh, to reveal God's character and then Jesus left and once again God's character has been clouded through the history of uh, Christianity and, and we see God through glass darkly as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 13 uh, and God is present with this world in a non-visible way but in terms of the future we've got most wonderful description of what's going to happen in Revelation 21, that God will make his dwelling with us. We'll see him face to face and he will wipe away every tear from their faces, you know? So this is for me, the picture of the future. The world is not going to get any better. We have all kinds of problems. Uh, we have uh, climactical issues. We've got, we see the badness of human nature and, and there's more and more evil that occurs, but evil is always with us, but it's somehow we know about it more because of the 24 hour news cycle. We know what's happening around the world, all the evil and everything, but there's a promise. There's a promise that there is a time when Jesus will come again. And, and this is the moment, this is the time when God will make his dwelling with us and we'll be living in his presence forever and ever. And this is my hope. This is what I believe. And I'm looking forward to the day when evil will be no more. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I think, um, I'm sure we have a lot to take away from this. Uh, so I would just ask us to uh, share something, uh, one thing or a few things that you're taking from this discussion. Um, and then, um, I will, uh, towards the end of the, towards the concluding part of the discussion, Darius, I will come back to you for um, inviting mm -hmm. you to share something for our viewers. Mm -hmm. So takeaways. I can go. Um, so I, I really liked when you highlighted that Adventist doctrine is not particularly new. It's just our co compilation of doctrines that have been already thought of before and, and recognized in scripture. And I think that's potent because it, it gives us a connection to the rest of humanity and it allows us, or well, it forces us to be more humble, I think, about our, mm -hmm. our view of the Bible. Sometimes it's easy to be like, look, I have this, I have truth, I have knowledge, I know what's right. But in reality, you're not the one who recognized that. There's a lot of other people that God revealed this truth to before, and it I think it gives us an attachment to the rest of humanity that mm -hmm. is critical, uh, and and we need that humility. And I like that a lot. Well, I can go next. Um, so actually, when I was young, I memorized this part of from the steps to Christ. And it starts, nature and revelation alike testify of God's love. And today, uh, this really touched me personally because I could understand how like, God actually is present in here, in nature as well, and in present. So it really gave me uh, this sense of 
uh, God's presence and how we should live and how we should face against evil and the things that we commonly see around this world and this hopeless world. But we should also remember that God is still here and His grace is still present. Um, so my takeaway is um, I was in the last session as well and it was more philosophical and it was very difficult to understand in a lot of different ways. But for this um, um, conversation, I noticed that it could be as simple as just that human is the evidence of God's existence. And I think that really take, talks about a lot, which means that um, God's grace could be seen by human, just, just by you leaving. So when I think from my takeaway is that um, I have a lot of friends sometimes um, question me about like, is there anything good in this world left? especially when they're in the moment, like before they really want to choose to end their life. A lot of um, friends question that. But then I think I could just easily say that just you are being alive is the evidence that God is present. Like he's just right now with you. So I think this was a really blessing for me to learn about that. Wonderful. Um, I could probably share a couple of things too. In addition to all of that, um, I think for me, the concept that really was intriguing was to see, especially in such a short conversation, to see us touching on so many different aspects of God's presence. It's, it's almost like he's everywhere. Um, and I think sometimes when he, when he, when for me, at least before I wasn't attaching the idea of presence to all these things, I was, I was attaching them to God, but not to, to the concept, concept of presence, if that makes sense. So presence was something more isolated and more abstract, um, but now it becomes more concrete by, under, by attaching it to these different facets, these different aspects of humanity and human life, um, nature, um, uh, humans, um, history. Um, it's, it's, like, it's like Hume said, everywhere there is something, God is present. <laughs> uh, well, except for the evil, but that's another conversation. Um, and so for me, especially Revelation 21 is definitely is my favorite passage of the Bible. Um, I look forward to the unmediated presence of God, where I can be face to face uh, as Adam and Eve, as uh, Moses. He's my favorite character in the Bible for that reason. And I think it's, it just gives me a lot of hope that um, my life has um, as a future. I don't think of the future in terms of this life. I think of the future in terms of eternity because I know that God has promised that to me. So for me, when I say future, I see God in it in a more personal way, an ever more personal way. And, um, and I think also the quality of our presence to each other will definitely increase. So in that sense, um, this, the aspect of presence interpersonal to each other and with God is really something that um, is prevalent in everything in our future. Um, so that's something that gives me a lot of hope and makes my present much more meaningful from that perspective. Thank you to everyone for the participation in the discussion. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Kian. Thank you, Aaron. Of course, Darius, invaluable. I really appreciate your... I had no idea what we're going to talk about, but I <laughs> am so thankful for this discussion and the way you have led us into um into the concept from the historical perspective um if you have been watching us uh we appreciate your time and your presence uh i think you will be blessed i think it will be time well spent and uh we do not take it for granted i know that there are so many things you could do with this one hour so if you've chosen to spend it with us we definitely appreciate it and we hope it is a blessing for you as well. Um, I would invite you also to uh, spend uh, an hour with us next time. In our next episode, uh, Dr. Christy Chadwick, an anthropologist, will discuss about God's presence from that perspective, from archaeology and anthropology in general. Um, I do not know, as usual, I don't know where the guests will take us, so I'm just as intrigued as you. Uh, but I know that we will continue to deepen uh, our understanding of the concept of, of God's presence and of what, what presence means. So we invite you to join us um, next time, uh, which will be March 30, 7 p.m. Eastern time. And um, to conclude this conversation, of course, uh, Darius, you have the last word. What would you say to our viewers about uh, God's presence in history or in general? I would say train yourself to see God's presence in the world around you. 
and your life will be far better. Because we tend to see evil, we tend to see bad things, we tend to focus on on injustice and on on uh, the difficult issues. And yes, certainly those issues exist and we need to be aware of them. But when we train ourselves to see God's presence everywhere around you in human touch, in nature, uh, then that gives us hope. And I pray that you will just, it's, it's a matter of training, matter of focusing your eyes on Christ and his presence in the world. Thank you so much, Darius, for your time uh, and your wisdom uh, in your spiritual direction. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much to the discussion group and to our viewers. And uh, we hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.